boom, to some degree. Uh, in games, what we see is these communities, these very elaborate communities building up around these things. And some people come in as a casual player, but over time they might start collecting stuff by downloading it off the web. Uh, eventually they might start their own website, or even start making stuff to share to other people. And these elaborate communities uh, have a real shape to them. They're almost like kind of an ecosystem. There's a pyramid with a very broad group of casual players at the base that are really supporting the high-level creators at the top. But for a lot of people, this community becomes the really long-term, interesting part of this, a community built around a specific activity, or a property, or a movie even. Uh, Spore, which is the last game I worked on, involved players creating all these different things, creatures, buildings, vehicles, planets, and then sharing them automatically. You know, as you play, you actually create this stuff and shared it. Uh, we came out with this thing called the Creature Creator ahead of the game, where people can just make creatures and share them. Um, we were hoping, we were going to release the game about two months later, based upon past experience, that we would get about 100,000 of these creatures by the time we launched the game. Uh, instead, after we released the Creature Creator, we got uh, that many in about 22 hours. Um, we had a million new creatures that we made within a week. Uh, and, you know, over the, two, the first two months or so, we got about 45 million different things that the players had made. Uh, you know, which comes out to about 30,000 an hour. So, as an engine of creativity, uh, these communities are incredible. I mean, they're just, you know, awesome in that sense. You know, we passed 100 million uh, in almost no time. And, you know, Earth right now has about maybe 7 million unique species on it. So, just to give you some point of comparison there. Uh, <laughs> I was in a talk last week, this guy, James Paul Gee, uh, gave actually some really good uh, rules of thumb for what makes a good educational experience. And it was amazing how well they lined up with uh, gaming experiences. Um, he actually had 16 points that I'll kind of just kind of breeze through right here. A lot of them had to do with, you know, the learner, you know, just been having an identity in this, you know, reason to do it. Um, being able to actually work on customizing it or making it unique to themselves, but also being able to take risk and fail. Uh, there's also well-ordered problems, like in a game, the ramping of that model is something that we can very much design in a way that's really hard to do kind of out in the analog world. And, you know, the console, uh, the challenges are done in such a way that they're right at the kind of level of competency of the player. There's also situated meaning. You're not learning algebra because you know your teacher says you'll need it someday. You're learning algebra because you're not going to defeat that boss until you you know learn it or whatever the problem set is. Uh, but also games, I think, kind of get you out of necessarily ordered problem solving and get you to think in very different ways. You know, you can apply very different types of thinking to a lot of the situations in these things. Uh, when I was a kid, this is something I used to go to called the library. <laughs> um, one of the rules of thumb is like the you know, Library of Congress is like this amazing thing. You know, the Library of Congress, it turns out, has about 20 terabytes of non-digital information in it. Uh, you can buy a terabyte hard drive about that big right now, you know, fit 20 of those in your backpack. Um, so about this year sometime, they're coming out with thumb drives that are one terabyte, uh, which is just amazing when you think about it. The problem is really not, you know, the access to additional material, I think. The problem is motivation, and this has been said before, you know, that really if you can motivate a kid, you know, to be interested in this stuff, through technology, through entertainment, through whatever, then you just have to get out of their way. There are plenty of cool resources out there for that kid, if they really want to learn something, to learn it right now. Um, so really, we just need, we need to kind of grease the wheels here. You know, for me and my generation, Star Trek was just an amazing inspiration, you know. A lot of people, scientists, joined NASA, you know, as a result of watching things like this. Um, you know, 2001 uh, is what got me interested in computers. I didn't know whether I might be conversing, you know, with a homicidal computer. It was just intriguing. <laughs> <laughs> in some sense, we can take think of any, you know, any technology as an extension of our bodies. You know, a car extends our legs, you know, television, telescope our eyes, cloth in our mouth, you know, uh, clothing, buildings, our skin. Computers can extend a lot of these things, but I think the most important thing they extend really is our imagination. Uh, you know, and basically going forward in the complex world that we're dealing with, you know, the ability to kind of build more elaborate imaginary models is going to be just invaluable. And so I think we need to think about how to embrace these, you know, not just to educate our kids, but to motivate and interest them in basically the world around them. So I'm going to shut up now. <laughs> <laughs>